blood cell. And, and who knows where things are going to go beyond that. In, in fact, there, there are already hundreds of nanotechnology products on the market today. And you think right now that I'm talking science fiction, but in fact, I'm talking science fact. You just had donated to your school a 3D printer. So what it does is, it makes three-dimensional solid objects of virtually any shape from a digital model by building on successive layers of material. So, I could use that to build a physical object like a hammer or a vase, or, and they're already doing it, I could literally use that to print a replacement kidney for you. This is a real picture. These are nanospiders. These are invented by a group of scientists at Columbia University. These are 100,000 times smaller than a human hair, and they're made from DNA molecules. And these molecular robots, because that's what they are, they are programmed to detect disease markers on a cell surface. So they can instantly identify whether it's cancerous, and then what they can do is they can bring a compound to that specific cell to kill the cancer. And that is just now, because I'm pulling my punches. I could throw, show, throw things in front of you right now that would have some of you saying, that's it, I'm out of here. I've only got two years, four months, six days, five hours to retire. I don't need this crap. These are absolutely amazing, astounding, astonishing times that we live in right now. My question is, what world are we preparing our students for? Are we preparing them for their future? Are we preparing them for our past? Are we preparing them for the world that awaits them or the world that we grew up in? Are we waiting, are we preparing them for the economy of the future or the economy that we've been living in for the last 50, 60, 70 years? Here's what I want you to do. We're going to take two minutes and I want you to turn to the people around you and that includes everybody, including you sitting by yourself at the back of the room there, okay? Otherwise, if you don't talk to anybody, I'm going to come and stand in front of you and my projectile spitting problem is not completely under control, okay? What I want you to do is I want you to try and summarize in three minutes your responses to what you've seen so far. Where you go? Three minutes. <laughs> Don't sit by yourself or I'm coming to get you. Okay, come on back to me, please. I need to be really clear about something here. I am not a technologist. I am not into techno gruel and techno lust. Okay? I don't worship the altar of technology. Okay? I don't know about you, but some of this scares the heck out of me. Okay? Because there are enormous implications on so many levels. Okay? I'm a curriculum specialist. I'm into learning. And so the real question that I need to ask here is, what does this mean for the future of learning? Well, let me go off on a tangent here. Powerful forces are globalizing and transforming just about every aspect of the world economy. And, I, and I'll tell you this, regardless of the kind of school, can you bring those lights down please, okay? Regardless 
of the fact that you are in this school, a private school, or a public school, this, this transformation has enormous implications for education. It has enormous implications for current educational practices. Because what we've seen is a fundamental shift in the new workplace. So in the past 20 years, we've seen an almost complete disappearance of the factory job and the factory mindset. Let's you know, factory jobs were the work that traditionally didn't require a lot of special talents or, or knowledge or training or education. So what you could do is you could literally go down to the factory and get a job, and within a couple of days, you'd be up and running. And, and because these jobs didn't require any special training or skills, Literally anybody could do it. You could even drop out of high school and, and, and get yourself a job, a well-paid, a well-protected union job for life. Today, we have a replaceable and a disposable workforce. And, and, and as a result of that, those jobs are all but completely disappearing from the economy. Why? Because they can be done by anybody, anywhere. It's estimated, over the course of the last 20 years, literally hundreds of thousands of factories have closed in the first world countries literally throwing hundreds of millions of people permanently out of work. Why? Well, because it's the same raw materials, it's the same machinery, and it only requires low-level skills. And you see, where labor is the cheapest is not in first-world countries, but it's in the developing world. You ever wonder where all those manufacturing jobs went to? I'll show you exactly where they went to. They went here, right here. This is the Danish ship, the Emma Maersk. This is one of 20 such ships that are already sailing or currently being built. Now understand that the Emma Maersk transports up to 20,000 14-ton, 7-meter containers from China to New Zealand or Australia or to Europe or North America or the Middle East, almost anywhere on the planet in less than a week, okay? And what they do is, in these containers right here, they carry manufactured products and even agricultural goods that are produced in China at a fraction of what it would cost them to produce in first world countries. That's why, and that's where manufacturing and even agricultural jobs are beginning to disappear, because much of the work that was previously done in the first world countries, it's quickly vanishing because it can be done cheaper overseas, and this has particularly happened in the last 15 years. Now, there's one exception to this mass exodus of work, okay? That's unless the work being done is what's called location dependent, where, where workers have to be at a specific location to do their job. Now, now people who, whose jobs are location dependent would involve oil workers or construction workers or plumbers or taxi drivers or barbers or auto technicians, delivery service people, restaurant workers, cleaning staff, and so on. These kinds of jobs are location dependent because the worker performs the tasks on site. But the increasing global reality is that if a job involves routine cognitive work that is not location dependent. Routine cognitive work is anything that involves repetitive mental tasks. It not only can, but it is being outsourced or offshore. Now, routine cognitive work would include people who do things like bookkeeping and taxes and data entry clerks and computer programmers and legal researchers and call centers and receptionists and help desks and, and, and customer support. Even the people who interpret MRIs and x-rays do routine cognitive work. And the thing is, whether they're white collar or blue collar, all of these kinds of workers do the same mental tasks over and over again. And in the global economy, workers in these fields today have to compete not only with people in the, in the same city or the next city or the next region, they also have to compete with a global labor workforce. For example, I use something called ODES. ODES allows employers anywhere in the world to quickly assemble virtual global work teams on a project-by-project -project basis. And if you go out to ODES, it's unbelievable because there are more than 5 million private contractors from hundreds of countries around the world who work in every imaginable work category, web development, writing, customer service, software development, sales and marketing, even math and science teachers from India who work with students in Britain using Skype. You see, these are people who can be hired in many cases for what is a fraction of what it would cost to hire an employee in the first world. Now, now some people call this outsourcing. Many other people understand that this is the new global reality and we are not going back. This is just the new way of doing business. This is the new normal. Now, you may not see how this connects to your students. You may not like these developments. 
But this is absolutely the new reality of the global digital marketplace and the economy. And as a result of that, what's happening is, literally, hundreds of millions of jobs are disappearing because this new digital technology allows companies to send work overseas where workers do routine cognitive work much cheaper than workers can in the first world. So the bottom line is that if the work can be outsourced, if the work can be offshore, it probably is going to be. Because in an increasingly global economy, it's the only way that businesses can stay competitive. See, we live in this new digital landscape, and so information travels back and forth at the speed of light over global digital networks. And it makes very little difference if the information is going from one desk to another desk in an office on the third floor, or whether it's going from the third floor to the third world, because technology makes organizing, managing, and collaborating with a global team of simplicity. Now, routine cognitive work can also be automated. It can be turned into hardware, it can be turned into software, it can be turned into robots. For example, every time you use Expedia or any of the other travel sites, to make a hotel reservation or to purchase an airline ticket over the internet. Every time you drop your mortgage numbers into a web form, what you have unconsciously done is you've taken away some frontline, routine cognitive evaluation professional's job. Think about legal software, think about tax preparation. If a job or a task can be reduced to a mathematical algorithm, it is very easy for us to produce software or hardware that's going to do it for us and it's going to do it for us cheaper. And as a result of that, just like that, that job, or that segment of the job, is, or is soon, going to be gone. Well, where am I going with this? I don't know, I'm faking this as we go, okay? In his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, writer Richard Florida says, that you can divide first world workers and the first world workforce into four basic groups. He describes the first group as the agricultural class. They're in the green right here. In 1900, in the first world, Almost 40% of workers were involved in agriculture. Today, in 2013, globally, in first world economies, that number is down to less than 2% of the workforce, primarily because of automation. Because what used to be done by, by hundreds of workers and thousands of animals can now be done by one worker and a single machine, or in some cases, not even a human being, just using a robotractor. The second group, in the red, or what we call the working class. These are the classic manufacturing jobs. These are the jobs that only require basic skills to perform. And Florida's data show that these types of jobs peaked right after World War II, and they've been in steady decline ever since. The third group in the orange are what are called the location-dependent workers. They're the service industries. They're the helping professionals. They're the routine cognitive workers. And you, and you notice here, that these types of jobs peaked about 1980 and they're now steadily shrinking primarily because of the growing power of personal computers. And the fourth group in the pink is called the creative class. These are the people that regularly do non-routine cognitive work and consistently apply 21st century abstract skills to the workplace. And you can see here that there's been a sharp uptake in demand for creative class workers since 1980, once again primarily because of the growing power of personal computers. Now, if you take this chart and you convert it to a stack bar like this, you notice that between 1900 and today, there's been a steady decline in agriculture in the green at the bottom, and there's been a steady growth in the creative class in the red at the top. In 1900, only 10% of first world workers were needed these things called abstract creative cognitive skills. Today, here in 2013, that number is estimated to be 35%, and this number continues to accelerate primarily because of the growing power of technology. This number is estimated to reach 50% of the workforce by 2017. You understand that 2017 is the year that students that are in grade 8 in your school right now are in a complete secondary school. Now, if you look at this chart, it appears that we have a fundamental problem. It's absolutely beyond dispute that our schools were designed for an era where three quarters of the working population were employed in agriculture and manufacturing jobs. But you know and I know that those times and those jobs and that world is gone. And in fact, they've actually been gone for a long, long period of time. The problem is 
that the same educational institutions, the same instructional models, the same organizational structures are now operating at a time where three quarters of first world workforces are working in creative class and service class professions. And the problem is, I know that you do a great job preparing kids to go on. I know that a significant number of your kids go on to successfully complete college. But the problem is that our educational system is continuing to embrace traditional structures, traditional organizations, traditional instructions, standardized curriculum, and traditional tests as the only way to assess learning at the very same time that the new global economy is almost completely eliminating standardized jobs. And we are certainly not being truthful when we assure our students and their parents that if they master the traditional content and they do well on the SATs, that that's all they're going to need to know and be prepared for the rest of their life, particularly when researchers like Bob Marzano tell us that about 80 to 85 percent of the work that students do in classes today is focused on factual recall and low-level procedures. In other words, 80 to 85 percent of what kids do in classrooms today is based on routine cognitive work. The work that's increasingly disappearing or being outsourced or offshore. Now you take a look at this picture right here. I am a classroom teacher at heart. My God, look at this classroom. It's bright. It's colorful. And the teacher clearly has all of the students participating and raising their hands and engaging. But I'll tell you this, looks can be really deceiving. Because the problem is that underneath it all, the structural model, the instructional mindset, and the learning assumptions of this classroom right here are almost exactly the same as they were more than a hundred years ago. A hundred years on from this picture right here, in many classrooms, the teacher continues to be the focal point of the classroom. Students continue to sit in rows and columns. Student work, work individually at their desks. Structurally, the biggest difference in the room is probably the color of the blackboard and, and the class size. And as a result of that, as my friend David Warwick points out, no generation in history has ever been so thoroughly prepared for the industrial age as the current generation. You laugh, but you need to understand that the traditional classroom is a relic. It's left over from the Industrial Revolution, which required a large workforce with very basic skills. And, and, and the problem is this, I know you're doing a great job and you deserve to get a pat on the back, but it's not enough anymore. And the problem is, unless we change our thinking, all the current reform efforts currently underway in education, all they're going to do is going to preserve the traditional classroom as our children's primary place of learning deep into the 21st century because current classroom-based education lags, believe me, far behind when it's measured against its ability to deliver the creative and agile workforce that the 21st century demands. And, and, and one indication of the growing irrelevance of schools for a lot of students is that they are increasingly disengaged from the classroom. You know why? Because what they're learning is not relevant to them or the world they and we are living in. And, and it's beyond debate that the skills and knowledge that they will need to be successful in secondary school and college, they are a very different set of skills than the ones that they're going to need to be successful in life. The, the, the circumstances that, that we find ourselves in at this moment were perfectly described more than a hundred years ago by the great philosopher Alfred North Whitehead when he wrote, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. That the major advances in civilization are processes that all but wreck the societies in which they occur. That's disruptive innovation. Our schools and our classrooms were originally designed to be, and to this day, continue to primarily be information delivery systems in an age where information is readily available anytime, anywhere, to almost anyone. And you see, what I need you to take away is not your hat as a, as, a, as a teacher, but your hat as a parent, as a citizen, as a community member, and, and, and get you to understand that if the world outside of education is fundamentally transforming because of disruptive innovation, fundamentally transforming because of exponentialism, 
We can't just pretend that education as we know it right now is immune to the global changes that are happening in every part of our lives. And although you might not like what I'm saying, and you might not feel comfortable with what's happening right now, this world and this economy that we are facing right now, okay, this has become the new normal. It is not a temporary anomaly that eventually will return to normal. So more than anything else, please hear me, we can't just pretend but all we need to do is tinker with the existing educational system and that everything will be all right because it won't be all right. If we continue to let our paradigms, if we continue to let our educentrism rule our assumptions or suicides about teaching and learning and assessment, education and your jobs are in great danger. This, this was perfectly explained by the great philosopher Eric Hoffer when he wrote, in times of radical change, the learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves perfectly equipped for a world that no longer exists. Despite the fact that your kids do well on tests, despite the fact that your kids go on to college and be successful in college, what I'm telling you is this. Right now in our schools, we're doing a great job of preparing our kids for 1970. And I may be being optimistic when I say that. Now, I want to finish this presentation with a little exercise to test your level of change awareness. Okay, it looks like this. Now, there are going to be some of you, as there were last night, who think you've seen this before. How many of you think you've seen this before? Okay? If you've seen it before, shut up. <laughs> Sorry. Don't blurt out the answer, okay? Now, here is the scenario. There are six students. Three students are wearing white t-shirts, three students are wearing black t-shirts. Each group of students has a basketball, and when I click go here, they're going to be passing the basketballs back and forth. Now, your task, and it's a complicated task, is going to be to count the number of passes made in 30 seconds between the white-shirted students. Doesn't matter whether they're a bounce pass or a chest pass or a behind the back pass or a lob, as long as the completed pass. Now the problem is, they're going to be moving around fairly quickly, so it's going to be kind of complex. That's why I stopped the action right here. Remember again, here's the task. The number of passes made by the white-shirted students in 30 seconds. Now you need to know that there is a very significant gender difference between men and women when it comes to the ability dealing with this kind of attention to detail when there's lots of action going on. How many of you in this room think that women are better at this? Hands up. Oh, come on, women. Don't look at the men next door for approval, please. How many of you think that men are better at this? Okay? How many think it doesn't matter? Okay, here we go. The number of passes made in 30 seconds between the white-shirted students. Completed passes. Ready? Set? Go. Call out a number. 15. Six. Okay, I heard 15 over here first. How many of you got 15? Hands up. Okay. All right. All right. I need to see male, female here. Okay. Okay. I'm going to I heard 16. How many? Got, okay. How many got 16? Okay. There. And another number. Only two numbers. I had somebody give me 82 the other day. Now here's the thing. Don't blurt out the answer. Did any of you see anything unusual happen on the screen? Hands up. Okay, that's about normal. These people typically are the people that don't pay attention to the instructions, but I won't do that, okay? I'll give you a hint what some of you missed. Here's the hint right here. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to show you the very same video again, and yes, it is the same video. Do not accuse me after just swapping out the video. It is exactly the same video, only this time, instead of counting the number of passes, I want you to look at things globally and I want you to see if you notice anything different on the screen. Are you ready? Set. 
God. How many of you still didn't notice anything different? Okay. Here's my question for you. How can you possibly <laughs> not see a six foot guy in a suit come across in front of you, beat his chest, and then go off the I mean, come on! How many of you still don't know what the hell I'm talking about? So how many of you saw it the second time? Hands up. Hands up. Okay? Alright, y'all. Okay, here's the thing though. Some of you are feeling smart because it's not the first time, right? The only problem is there wasn't one thing that happened there. There were three things that happened there. So I'm going to give you the last chance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the very same video again. And what I want you to do is every time something unusual happens on the screen, I want you to call out what they are. There should be three of them. Are you ready? This is your last chance. Set. Call them up. Go. Call them up. Here we go. Really loud when you call them up. Here comes one, two. Okay, number one. Number one. The girl steps off. Number two, the A steps on. What's the third one? The screen at the back changes from red to orange. Now, this is really important. This video comes from research done at the University of Illinois by a guy by the name of Dan Simon. This is called the Invisible Gorilla Research. And what just happened to some of you in this room is what we call perceptual blindness. Perceptual blindness happens when you miss something obvious, like a six-foot guy in an eight suit come across the screen, turn and beat his chest. Now, here's how things happen. Cognitively, I primed you to look for something specific. I primed you by giving you a specific task. I asked you to count the number of passes made between the white shirt and suits. And then, at the very last minute, and this was completely intentional, I seriously upped the ante by telling you there was a gender difference between men and women when it comes to this task, which of course there isn't. I lied. And when I did that, I created a huge problem in your brain. Listen very carefully. This is important. If you don't have a specific frame of reference for something, it's more than just confusing to us. It's more than just confusing to our brain. In fact, what happens is our brain is actually conditioned to refuse to see it. In other words, if you're not expecting to see something, you literally won't see it, even if it's standing right in front of you, beating its chest. And that, that is the real story of this presentation. This presentation is about learners who see the world differently than we do. So let me ask you, let me ask you some really important questions. How many, things, how many important things are going on in your lives? How many important things are going on with your partners? How many important things are going on with your children? How many important things are going on with your families? How many important things are going on with your friends? How many important things are going on in your community that you're just not seeing because you're just not paying attention to them? And in the same way, put on your educator's hat for a second here, how many important things are going on in your classroom? How many important things are going on with your students? How many important things are going on in your schools that you're missing because you're focused elsewhere? You're focused on the short term. You're focused on testing. You're focused on meeting the curriculum requirements. You're focused on getting your students ready for the next topic, for the next test, for the next term, for the next level of education, for the next grade level. Because if you can't see a six-foot gorilla walk across the screen, turn and beat its chest. You better ask yourself, how many other things are you missing in your students' lives because you're just not looking for them? And that's 
what I need you to leave this presentation with. What I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. Please close your eyes. We're going to sing Kumbaya. No, we're not, okay? And I want you to think about what you've seen here today. I want you to think about what you've learned here today. I want you to think about what's going on in your students' lives. I want you to think about what's going on in your professional lives, your personal lives, the lives that are closest to you. So come back to me. Let's finish and head out of here with a little activity called 3, 2, 1. Let me just ask a question before we start. How many of you in the last 60 minutes have heard or seen something that you hadn't heard or seen before? Hands up. And the rest of you, I notice, suffer from what we call the law of diminishing astonishment, right? Being there, done that, bought that t-shirt, right? Okay, I'm gonna do an activity called 3, 2, 1. I'm gonna come down and ask a few people to give their answers. Here are the things I want you to do. I want you to first of all identify three things you know now that you didn't know before you came into this presentation today and why, as an educator, it's important you know them. Three things you know now, got it? The next thing I want you to do is I want you to identify two questions that you still need to have answered here. Now, the third question is the most important. It costs a lot of money and it disrupts a lot of time to put on events like this. And do you understand that staff development without a follow-up is malpractice? If you come away from this presentation and you've gained nothing, it's been a complete waste of your time, it's been a complete waste of my time, it's been a complete waste of our time. So, three things you know now that you didn't know before. Two questions remain, and this is the most important one. One action you are going to commit to taking starting right now to move yourself, to move your children, to move your family, to move your school, to move your students, to move your colleagues from where they are to where they need to be. Margaret Mead never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Three minutes to answer those questions right there. Where you go? Really loud. Thank you. That was really good. Okay, next. That, okay. That's, that's my response. Okay. Kind of. Um, All right, one question. I don't know what to do with any of it. All right. I, I just don't know what to do with any of it. Um, I don't know how, I don't know what it means for it's the kids in front of me. 
I don't know what it means in, in terms of my interaction with students. Um, and then I'm, I, I li now I'm going to be living in fear <laughs> about what I don't see. Yeah, I, all I want you to do, all I want, I'm asking you to do is to step back and start looking. One of the, one of the finest things I ever did in my life was I, I flew back from Australia where I'd been doing uh, five days of speaking, and I flew back to Vancouver at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I picked up my car and picked up my steps out of three of his closest friends, and I took them.